Is it good? Yes, okay, we cool. can see well. So today I'm going to talk about this uh, recent work we did with some uh, people in our group in Paris, uh, Bruno, Florent and Lenka, on phase retrieval, uh, which recently appeared uh, on the archive as well. So first, let me start by describing maybe a broader class of models, uh, among which uh, belongs phase retrieval, which are generalized in our models. So the most generic kind of model we're going to consider here is of this type, where you have some signal in n dimensions that you're trying to recover for the observations of uh, y mu, which is generated via a noisy observation of the matrix vector product of a sunsig matrix and x and the signal, right? So you have your signal, you multiply it by a, a sensing a random sensing matrix, and then you, it goes through a probabilistic observation channel, and that's what you observe when you're trying to infer the vector x star from these observations. And in our setup, we're going to have uh, n dimension for the signal and the uh, uh, m observations. So in this setup, uh, the most generic way to state that you are looking at a phase retrieval problem is to say that the, the measurements should only depend on the modulus or the absolute value in the real case of this matrix vector product. All right. So even in the, in the noiseless case, which corresponds to this, y mu directly equals to the modulus square. There are, this problem is highly non-trivial. There are already many algorithms and techniques which have been developed from uh, very different points of view, from semi-definite programming, from spectral methods, from uh, non-convex optimization, etc. Here we are taking a, a quite specific uh, point of view. That is, we are trying to, underst uh, to, are trying to understand what are the, the fundamental limits of phase retrieval when you consider a random set. Right? So you consider a random matrix, a random signal, and you're trying to understand the typical uh, uh, properties of this problem. What is the typical performance that you can obtain, optimal performance? And uh, so let me emphasize that this is very different from, the, from other studies, for instance, which focus on the injectivity properties that would be some kind of, of worst case uh, bound. So, okay, let me now, specify a bit more exactly how the questions we're going to try to answer on the, on the, the model. So the, the Is the problem only on my side? No. I also cannot hear. Yeah, me neither, so. Yeah, I guess he has a problem. Antoine, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know. I think it's my connection which completely, which had a, a, an issue. Uh, okay, let me share again. Sorry for the, for the problem. Okay, is it working again now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. So, okay. So let me let me take it back here. So, what is the minimum number of samples in the high dimensional limit that we need to recover the signal at least? better than a random guess, that if we uh, recover a finite fraction of the signal, uh, can we recover it perfectly in a, in a sense that has to be defined, and which, what are the performance of the optimal polynomial time algorithms for this problem? Right, so the, now I'm going to describe the main hypothesis that we have for, for our study, which are quite generic. So the, the signal and matrix would be either real or complex. So I'm going to define this parameter beta, which is one in the real case, and two in the complex case. I'm going to assume that I have some, uh, the, the signal is generated via some prior distribution that I know with variance rule. And uh, on the sensing matrix, I'm going to have uh, two hypotheses. So I'm going to assume that it's uh, orthogonally invariant on the right, meaning that its right eigenvectors are completely delocalized. And I'm also going to assume that it's empirical uh, singular value distribution uh, converges in the large n limit. All right, so this, in terms of random matrix models, this is actually a very generic hypothesis. It encompasses a lot of, uh, of, of possible models, like, of course, the Gaussian models. But you can also consider an uh, arbitrary product of Gaussian matrices, random, um, uniformly sampled, unitary or orthogonal matrices, 
And more generically, I mean, if you have an asymptotic spectrum, a distribution, you can design a random matrix model very easily, which satisfies this hypothesis and which has the required uh, uh, asymptotic distribution. All right. So now that I have set up the, the, the framework, let me state our first result, which is very classical for our studies, which is a, a conjecture based on the, on the replica method of statistical physics. I've, maybe the, the most simplest way to state this is to say that there exists some scalar optimization problem, which I, I do not write it explicitly, but everything is completely explicit, which depends on two variables. So it's a supremum over two real variables of the sum of three terms, which decompose quite nicely between contributions from the prior distribution, contributions from the channel uh, observation distribution, and contributions from the spectrum of the sun matrix. Right, and this problem is completely explicit if you know the, uh, for a particular problem. And then if you can solve this problem, the claim is that you can obtain what is the information theoretic uh, minimal mean squared error simply by uh, considering QX here. Right, so this conjecture is obtained using our usual tools of statistical physics and the, the replica symmetric assumption. And okay, the first question we can answer is can we at least prove this conjecture is in some cases? And the answer is we can in two cases. The first one is if the, the matrix is Gaussian, real or complex. So the real case was already done a few years ago in a paper by, uh, by Jean Barbier and others. In the complex case, you have to be a bit more careful, but it basically goes through as well. And the other case in which we can prove it is if the prior is Gaussian and the matrix, a sensing matrix is basically a Gaussian matrix times a, a, another matrix, random or deterministic, uh, the assumptions on, on, on it are very, very light. And then in this, in one of these two uh, cases, we can prove the above uh, conjecture. And it uses some uh, interpolation uh, techniques that uh, were introduced uh, that are based basically on an idea of, of Guerra in the early 2000s and which have been refined a lot uh, since. Okay, so this is uh, maybe for the first uh, theoretical result. Another nice thing about this, uh, this uh, formulation is that, as I will describe now, is that it also gives access to algorithmic performances. So let me recall this, uh, this variational principle. And uh, it involves some function of two variables that I'm gonna call the replica symmetric potential. Right, so we're trying to maximize this potential to obtain the information theoretic uh, MMSC. And uh, there is also another nice properties of this uh, GLM problem is that it's a strong conjecture which has been shown in some cases, not in this most general cases, but it's widely believed that the, the optimal polynomial time algorithms in terms of uh, recovery of MMSC are actually uh, belong to the class of approximate message passing algorithms. Right. So these are algorithms which are quite involved, but they are explicit and iterative. And um, a very nice property of these algorithms, which has been proven in this case, is that the, they achieve a, a, an asymptotic error, which is given also by this replica symmetric potential. But instead of being the, the global maximum, is basically the local maximum, which is closest to the point of uh, Q equals zero. Q equals zero meaning MSC equals um, is maximal, so it's a random initialization, right? So if you start from a random initialization in this uh, replica symmetric potential, and you just do uh, the gradient ascent, you end up into the uh, the error which by uh, approximate message passing. So it's very nice because it allows to give, uh, uh, without doing any numerical simulations, it allows to investigate the existence of uh, computational gaps uh, just by considering the landscape of this potential. Right, so here I'm giving two very simple toy examples in which you can see that here there is actually a sort of a gap and here there is none. Uh, okay, so now let me focus a bit more on the phase retrieval. So the, the first uh, result I'm gonna state is about the weak recovery problem. So here we consider the phase retrieval problem in a very generic setup. So we just assume that the, the channel distribution is a function of the, of the modulus or the absolute value. And then we ask the question, what is the minimal number of measurements you need to beat a random guess in polynomial time, right? So what number of measurements do you need to get an, uh, uh, an MSC, uh, a mean squared error, which is non-trivial? And uh, we have a sharp answer for this, which is uh, given by this equation. This threshold is the solution of this equation. So it's a bit involved, but it's not that complicated. It involves uh, the characteristics of the problem, the channel and the, the spectral distribution. 
And uh, again, uh, we, we derived this using the analysis I presented before, and uh, because we said that we can investigate the algorithmic uh, um, uh, performances by looking at the replica symmetric potential, right? And uh, for instance, one interesting consequence that we can draw from this formula, which for which we don't really have an uh, intuitive uh, interpretation, is that for any phase retrieval channel, the highest quick recovery threshold is always going to be reached in terms of spectrums by orthogonal or unitary matrices, right? So this is some consequence which we could for which we don't really have an interpretation or an intuition, if someone has <laughs> this share, but it's uh, some interesting consequence, which is a very simple consequence of our equations. And uh, if you specialize this equation to the case of noiseless phase retrieval, it simplifies this a lot. And in particular, you can find back the previously known results for Gaussian matrices or for random uh, unitary matrices. Okay. So this is for the weak recovery problem. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to specify even more on the noiseless phase retrieval. So here I'm assuming the channel is noiseless. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask the question, how many measurements do you need to achieve the best possible recovery, right? So uh, from this point, adding more measurements would not improve your recovery of the signal. And the answer to this problem is actually uh, very simple in the sense that if you, if you define small r basically as a, the fraction of uh, non-zero uh, eigenvalues, then the threshold is simply given by beta r. So beta is, uh, uh, I, I recall, one in the real case, two in the complex case. So it's very simple. And uh, quite, I mean, interestingly, this can be derived in the real case uh, in a, using a very simple uh, counting argument, which was already uh, uh, originally made for, for compress sensing, which basically amounts to say that in the real case, if you know uh, a number, the absolute value of a number, you know it up to its sign, right? So if you know a vector of absolute values, you can basically, you have an exponential number of uh, possible vectors to try, but it's finite. And uh, so since we are looking at uh, information theoretical uh, thresholds, you can derive this, this threshold quite easily with this argument. However, in the complex case, we find that this threshold is 2R. And for the, in the complex case, you, cannot, you don't have such a simple counting argument. So as far as we know, we could only derive it using our replica symmetric potential analysis. And uh, now let me present a few, uh, briefly, some uh, numerical applications of our, uh, of our analysis. So here I'm again in the noiseless phase retrieval setup. And I'm going to present two simple cases. Of course, we could analyze uh, much more. But for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to focus on these two, uh, which are the complex Gaussian matrices and the column unitary matrices. So for, for these two cases, for instance, the weak recovery properties were already known. And uh, so here I am plotting as a mean squared error as a function of alpha, so basically the number of measurements. And uh, in, the, in the, the blue line is the predicted uh, optimal algorithmic performance. And the, the orange line is the information theoretic uh, optimal performance. So as you can see, and the, sorry, and the points are explicit uh, numerical uh, simulations of the algorithms. So as you can see, in both these cases, you have some uh, computational gap, meaning in, that in these uh, light blue regions, you cannot recover the signal. Uh, you cannot achieve the information theoretic uh, error in polynomial time, right? And as you can see, the, the points of the AMP algorithm really match the, the, the analytical prediction. Uh, so it's uh, all very coherent, right? And uh, from these plots, especially in the, in the unitary case, you can draw some conclusions as well, or some observations. Uh, for instance, the first observation, which is the last in this list, is that um, we also ran the algorithm for matrices, which in, a priori do not satisfy our uh, rotation invariance hypothesis. And namely, we took uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform matrices from which we randomly subsampled the columns. And still, the algorithm performs basically for these uh, matrices as well as for the uniformly sampled uh, unitary matrices, right? So it's, it seems to indicate that you could um, allow for some control structure without harming too much the performance of the algorithm and our results. And uh, also, interestingly, 
which we, we, we think was not already known. In the, in the unitary case, in the information theoretic sense, you see there is this all or nothing transition, meaning that for uh, at uh, alpha equal two, the, the information theoretic MMSC brutally drops from one to zero, right? And it's, again, uh, looking at, our, I mean, analyzing our equations, you can show that in the complex setting, the unitary matrices are the only matrices which can show such a transition. So again, something for which we don't really have an, an intuition. And uh, however, in the real case, you can find many random matrices, for example, the orthogonal ones, but there exist many others for which you have such a transition. So there seems to be uh, some kind of difference in this sense between the real and complex uh, phase attribute. Okay, so I think I'm already almost at the end. So let me uh, conclude uh, basically by, uh, by this slide, which uh, is a table that summarizes um, many of our results in a, in a compact way. So the, here, I'm, in the first column, I'm giving the, the random matrix ensemble and, the, and the, 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 all the lines are for noiseless phase retrieval, except the, the last three, which are for generic phase retrieval. And I'm giving the values of the different thresholds that we, that we can compute. So we have uh, this uh, weak recovery threshold, the full recovery threshold in the IT sense and in the algorithmic sense. And basically in red are results that uh, were not presented in the literature before. So this gives a nice overview of how our, our work basically tries to fill some gaps in the studies of, uh, of hard phases in phase retrieval. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and also maybe to point your attention to uh, the fact that we used a, a great numerical package for the simulation, which is called 3AMP, which was developed in the group, especially by, uh, by Antoine Baker. And they, had a, they have a paper on this now. And it's a really great modular package to code uh, approximate message passing for a lot of inference problems. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Antoine, for the great talk. We'll uh, 